Um, so my name is Jen Hopi Ferguson, and uh, I'm joining you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Sinanamuk, and uh, all of us actually are in Coast Salish territory, but of course, uh, various nations are represented here this evening. I am uh, also in Nanaimo. So uh, nice to be with all of you, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator uh, this evening. So we're looking forward to the discussion. Um, we, um, I think we'll just maybe go ahead and uh, and get started. We do have a couple of polls, which always makes it for a fun evening. Um, and uh, we've got with us Anita Ansari from uh, BC Hydro, Jerry Grant from the Juan de Fuca Regional District Emergency uh, Programmer, and then we have um, Allison Bird and John Cassidy, who right now is showing up as Jen Helpy, but it's not. I'm just going to fix that. Uh, John Cassidy, of course, is our seismologist, uh, one of our seismo friends. So uh, he and Allison will be sharing um, their knowledge with us. So um, I think uh, without without further ado, maybe we'll we'll get things rolling. But I'm going to ask you to uh, folks that are joining us, you can go ahead and type in the chat uh, where you're joining us from. If you have questions throughout the session, um, all of our panelists here are going to be really excited to answer those for you. We're going to give you some great tips and tricks. We're going to share our favorite things uh, in our emergency kit. So you can type any questions that you have into the Q&A box that's at, it could be at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen in your Zoom uh, toolbar. So please use that Q&A box. And then I will uh, also be monitoring the chat. So if there are, are questions, um, we will uh, we will do our best to answer those. And if we can't answer them here tonight, we most certainly will um, try to follow up by email. So I'll be uh, keeping track of this. We are recording this session and we will post it to our uh, BC Shakeout uh, YouTube channel tomorrow and everybody will get a copy of the recording that is registered. So thanks for being here with us. So um, I think let's, you know, Allison, let's just get into it. Let's let's talk earthquakes. So I think John and Allison are going to share um, some updates about earthquakes in British Columbia and um, and what we can expect. So Allison and John, over to you. All right. So John and I are going to tag team present and uh, we're really excited to be here today. I'm just going to fix things so I can see my screen properly. Uh, there we go. OK, so let's get started. And it's there. Go ahead, John. Uh, is John muted? Okay, I think we're back. Hello, <laughs> thanks, Allison. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you. Um, here in British Columbia, we we record, we locate uh, nearly three thousand earthquakes each year. So since the last, since we met for Shakeout last year, about this time. Every dot on this map has occurred since the last shakeout. So these are all of the earthquakes recorded, located in British Columbia over the past year. Um, most of them are very tiny. They're less than magnitude two or three, but you can see some larger ones here as well, some up in the magnitude four and five range. Most of the earthquakes and the largest earthquakes are off the coast. Uh, this is where the active faults are. And uh, as you move inland, the, the size and the, and the number of earthquakes drops off fairly quickly. So, but this gives you an idea of where earthquakes occur across our province. We have a very complex tectonic setting and, and, and a lot of earthquakes, including large earthquakes, uh, including some of the world's largest earthquakes that we'll talk about in, in a few minutes. Yeah, and I just want to show this short clip. It's very, very short. It's only a few seconds long. It's from the Kobe earthquake. Um, and the shaking actually lasted for about a minute and a half. So this is only a short part of the earthquake. And you can see that things are moving very strongly in the horizontal direction. Uh, the strongest waves uh, in an earthquake tend to be the um, these horizontal movements, which uh, can cause quite a bit of damage. So um, in terms of damage, uh, the most easily in, uh, damaged buildings are older masonry buildings, uh, brick or stone. And it's because the uh, mortar is, um, doesn't do very well under the shearing forces of the earthquake and cannot hold those, those heavy elements together. Uh, oops. Uh, this is an image of um, poorly reinforced concrete. There's great rebar going up the columns and along the beams, but very little transverse or wrapped reinforcement holding that together so it can stay linear and do its job. So this beam is now being held up by a Coke machine. Uh, houses, despite this image, tend to do quite well in earthquakes. 
What often fails though are porches or poorly constructed additions. Chimneys, especially dangerous if they fall toward the house. So in my house, I put extra planking around where the chimney passes through the attic so that if the chimney falls toward the house, those bricks don't punch through to the floors below. And then finally, garages don't tend to do very well because they've got a big open space on one end. So um, those are sort of typical pieces of damage. But, you know, most people think of earthquakes and they think there's going to be all this, these buildings collapsed. That's actually very rare, especially in North American architecture. So um, there is the, this is the typical. John? Yeah, and, and just building upon that, uh, in North America, the vast majority of the damage, the vast majority of injuries during earthquakes is caused by what we, what we call non-structural damage. Items falling down, light fixtures, uh, cabinets falling over. If you're in a grocery store, you know, remember this picture. This, this is what happens in every, every store following a significant earthquake. So you can expect items to fall off of shelves. Uh, you really want to protect yourself. And that's one of the key things of drop cover and hold on. So in, in this um, this other this room that we're looking at here with the damage, this is really the most common type of, of damage during uh, significant earthquakes here in North America, even during large California earthquakes. So um, when an earthquake happens, you can expect to be without utilities for uh, some time. So this is an, a map of Christchurch two weeks after the earthquake. Uh, the red neighborhoods have no utilities yet. Uh, the yellow ones have some of ut their utilities restored. So it could be essentially like you're camping for, for some time after an earthquake. And that lower left image could be the glamour of your life for a while. And so, um... Being prepared for earthquakes uh, is, is really important. It can really make your life much easier following a significant event. So having an earthquake kit and, and making sure that it's stocked regularly, checking on it and, um, uh, and having a plan with your, with your family, with your friends, your neighbors, especially neighbors, really important. Uh, some very, very simple things that you can do um, before an earthquake. And one of the most simple is just having shoes and a flashlight under your bed. The, the odds are that you'll be in bed at the time of an earthquake. Most of us are, um, you know, sleeping for six or eight hours. That's where we spend more time than any other room. Um, and so being prepared for that, uh, for power outage and broken glass, being able to move around your house. So shoes and slippers. Um, camping equipment is great for an earthquake kit. Uh, you're prepared to, um, uh, to be outside, outdoors, following a major earthquake. So earthquake camping, uh, camping equipment and simple things like strapping your hot water tank, uh, strapping heavy cabinets uh, to the walls so they don't fall over and either block your exit or, uh, or fall onto you. So, and keeping heavy items low down uh, on these shelves. So very, very simple things that you can do that will make life much easier. N95 masks that uh, we're all familiar with now. So having these handy uh, in your earthquake kit or in your home. Yeah, that that dust is that's dust you see, not smoke after the Christchurch earthquake, and you don't want to be breathing that. Um, so during an earthquake, uh, quite simply, drop, cover, hold on. Um, know what to do in each room of your home and practice what to do. Don't simply think about it because brains don't function very well under stress. And the whole idea of practice is to create that muscle memory so your body takes you to a safe space during an earthquake. If you're in bed, stay in bed, cover your head with your pillows. Um, if you're outside, stay away from hazards. If you're in your car, pull over somewhere, stay safe, set the parking brake and stay in your vehicle. So all these things are very simple things that can be done within a few seconds and greatly improve your safety. And of course, after an earthquake, after the shaking, uh, use your plan, the plan that you've put together uh, out of town contacts. Um, don't try phoning people. It's much, much better to use text only following an earthquake. Uh, expect aftershocks. Most earthquakes have aftershocks uh, that will continue for hours, days, or even weeks or, or longer. So uh, expect that. And for large earthquakes, uh, especially if you feel strong shaking for 30 seconds or 60 seconds, move away from the water. Uh, from, from If you're near the ocean, if you're near a lake, move away from the water and move up. Um, when it's safe, of course. Um, 
and that's you know what we're talking about is long and strong shaking where it's difficult to stand or if it's very long duration shaking not not one of these little magnitude two or threes where we feel uh, shaking for two or three seconds so in the event of a large earthquake you want to move away from the water because the shaking is your warning that there may be a tsunami or waves generated by that earthquake so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Earthquake Early Warning Program. I'm working on this one. Um, earthquake Early Warning has been proven in other countries. Uh, it's very effective. Uh, they use it in Japan, Mexico, Taiwan, and more recently in California, Oregon, and, and Washington. The earthquake is triggered by the P waves. That's the primary or pressure wave. It's the initial jolt or rumble you might experience. And then um, it sends the alert out before the arrival of the S wave. That's that big horizontal motion I talked about earlier. So I'm going to show this little video. So it provides usually about seconds to tens of seconds of warning. It doesn't sound like a long time, but that's enough time to take protective measures and really reduce the impact of that earthquake. I should note, though, that if you're very close to the earthquake's epicenter, you may not receive an alert before the shaking starts. So the idea is, oops, um, when the alert is received, um, uh, the public um, will do the drop cover hold on or whatever is re relevant for their situation. But also there may be uh, automated technologies in place that are triggered by this alert, uh, doing things like opening fire hall and ambulance bay doors so they don't get jammed shut and those vehicles can still get out. Closing valves to protect your water source and also prevent uh, hazardous chemicals from leaching onto the environment. Stopping elevators at the nearest floor and opening the doors. In Japan, when they started their system, initially it was just to stop trains and to stop uh, surgical procedures through uh, um, an alarm in hospitals. And uh, in, even recently they did this. Uh, there was an earthquake near Tohoku. Uh, trains were stopped, and it was very important that this happened because several of the um, railways, uh, the, the the rail routes were damaged, and those trains would have derailed had they continued on their journey. So all these things can be done within a short period of time, but they dramatically, dramatically reduce uh, the effect of the earthquake. Now, people will be receiving this alert through the National Public Alerting System, uh, through their cell phone, TV, and radio. And um, this is automated. You do not have to sign up for this and it's completely free of charge. So uh, John and I would like to thank you very much for, for joining us this evening and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thanks, Allison and John. Uh, always such great info. I mean, I think this earthquake early warning system might be my new favorite thing because I just think it's so cool that we can like, you know, stop a train and just, you know, buying that pre those precious moments that allow people to get to a safe space, right? Stopping a surgical procedure, ensuring that those elevator doors are open, and then and then emergency officials are not being redirected to get people out of an elevator. Um, they can actually go and help people if they require assistance. So just, yeah. you know, such, such a cool, such a cool thing. Um, I, I don't know if people caught this, but I'm going to share um, you, you know, one of the things, Allison, that you have often talked about, and folks can go to our YouTube channel and see your video that we did, um, where you talk about the, one of the things you talked about was chimneys and sort of that they, they can be hazardous if you have an older chimney, usually a brick chimney in your home. And maybe you could just share some of the things that you did to reinforce, um, you know, that part of your, part of your home. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always um, been concerned about that. And whenever I go for walks, I'm always looking at people's chimneys. It's one of those strange things that seismologists might do. Um, and so when um, I was looking at our chimney, I mean, even if it, even though it was repointed and fixed a few years ago, I still was concerned about that chimney falling toward the house. So um, I didn't go up in the attic because I don't like it up there, but I got someone to go up in the <laughs> attic and put um, extra planking around where that chimney passes through so that if it does fall toward the house, those bricks are not going to come through and and, and injure and injure us. Um, but you know, it, it makes us a lot safer. It's remarkable. It's a, such such a th simple thing to do, but it really reduces our stress. Uh, our sorry, our our our, our, um, our hazard and risk and and just little things like that. Like as John was talking about, making sure that your furniture, anything that's tall or heavy, or, or all your appliances are strapped to studs. Those things can move around to that big horizontal motion. And the same with the, you know, storing heavier items down low. Things fly out of cupboards and off shelves in an earthquake. You do not want something heavy coming and hitting you. 
Yeah, it's great tips. Thank you. There's, there are some great questions before I go to John with, with some more earthquake questions. But so I don't know, um, Allison, whether you or John want to take this one, but this is a great question. What are the risks for homes constructed in moderate to high risk liquefaction zones? And so you probably also want to touch on what liquefaction is for folks that may not know that term. And is there risk to life, high risk of damage? What are some of the things that we should prepare for? So John, did question. you want to take that one or do you want me to? Um, sure, I, 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 I'm happy to, to take that one. Um, the, the liquefaction hazard, liquefaction is when uh, soft soil um, that is water saturated is shaken and it loses its strength. And you can, you can do this if you go to the beach and just sort of move your feet up and down, you'll, you'll start to sink slowly. Um, so it's the soil essentially losing its strength. Sometimes it's at the surface. Sometimes it's it's well below the surface, um, so it really is quite dependent on on location. Uh, here in Victoria, there's a, a map that shows the the regions of higher uh, liquefaction hazard. They're really quite limited here in Victoria. Um, there are many um, more areas in in Greater Vancouver um, that are susceptible to liquefaction. Um, so certainly it's been recognized for a long time. We have a lot of experts in the Vancouver region, geotechnical engineers who have been aware of this and, and uh, in the building code and the major modern buildings that are designed and built um, are, are designed with that in mind. So either the, the soil is removed or piles are driven into the soil, it's strengthened. So it is mitigated for, for modern construction. Um, so it's, um, but for smaller homes uh, that are not covered by, by the uh, National Building Code, uh, it's, it is something to be aware of. If, if, you're, if you're near the water, if you're near a river, if you're on soft soil that is water saturated, uh, we certainly, it, it is a, an important factor in, in earthquake risk throughout um, you know, parts of southwestern British Columbia. To your local, I would say your local emergency management organization would have information on which areas might be most susceptible. Um, and if you want to, you can type uh, back in the Q and A if you want to let us know what area of British Columbia that you're inter that you're, that you're residing in. But um, you know there are there are some areas of British Columbia that are perhaps a little more um, prone to liquefaction than others. I don't know, John, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And and the most um, you know areas that are close to a river, or close to the water, um, a free face that can simply slip uh, towards the water. Those are the are the regions of greatest hazard. Um, but in in general, around southwestern British Columbia, parts of Richmond Delta, um, the soft soils that are close close to the ocean. Uh, this individual is saying Port Moody, so. I don't know <laughs> how close that is to the water. I don't know if you, yeah. you all do. So but. there have been a number of maps developed over the years, many of them by the British Columbia Geological Survey. So if you go to the BCGS website and do a search on liquefaction hazard maps um, that may be covered in, in one of those studies. I'll, I'll take a look at that. The other thing I'll do is when I when we when we circulate this, I'll also share um, some of the key, it's certainly based on the region that you're in, um, each municipality, regional district, or Indigenous government will also have links, usually on their main kind of um, uh, community page, that will have a, an emergency response or emergency preparedness button or link. And you can link, link there typically, and you can see inundation maps, you can see, um, get great tips for emergency preparedness. And there, then the hazards in those, in those specific communities are specific to your community, if that makes sense. So you know, the, the hazards in Grand Forks are going to be different than the hazards in Nanaimo or in Victoria or in Richmond. So it's really important to know and understand what the hazards are in your specific community and whether liquefaction happens to be one of the things that you should be uh, mindful of. Okay, um, a couple of great questions coming in here. So I'm just going to keep rolling with that. I, I like this one. What kind of, Allison, you sort of touched on this a little bit, but what kind of impacts can we expect on cell towers and communications? Um, sometimes they are uh, knocked out. Um, unfortunately, one thing that happens is when people experience an earthquake, they want to call everyone they know who they're concerned about. Um, and that's why we tell people, you know, do not use, don't, do, don't call those people because phone lines get overwhelmed. 
And then uh, people who need emergency services cannot get through. And we want those people, everyone, you know, people you care about to be able to get through to emergency services. So that's why we're saying text only. In terms of um, communications being taken down by the, the earthquake, it can happen. Um, usually there are there are backups, so that's, the system can still operate. Uh, so yeah, that, 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 that is a concern. In terms of, for the earthquake early warning system, the way that it works, um, the alert would would be received before the south towers would be knocked out because this, you get the alert before the strong shaking sort of idea. So, um, so the the system should still be able to work even in that situation. I know that the telecommunications providers um, nationally are looking at those redundancies and trying to identify yes. ways that you know other regions can provide support to any area that might be impacted by a disaster. I mean, even Hurricane Fiona a few weeks ago um, was a good example. You know, folks were without power and or telecommunications for a period of time. And so this is very much at the forefront of, uh, from, a, from a national perspective, it's certainly on government's radar. Uh, and I know all the major telecommunications companies have committed to um, supporting this. So more to come, I would say, um, I think in terms of in terms of what those redundancies might look like. Um, a couple more uh, interesting questions here. So one of the questions, Allison, you talked about what to do if you're in bed and, and an earthquake happens, cover yourself with a pillow. Uh, but Cassie's wondering, why would you stay in your bed? <laughs> Shouldn't you just get out and go somewhere else in your house? Why would you stay well, in your bed? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, a lot of people want to move to a different room. But the thing is, while you're moving, you sure can be thrown to the ground by the strong earthquake. Um, you can also um, uh, have things falling on you. So it's better really to stay put. Of course, before the earthquake, you've already taken down that big heavy picture that's over the head of your bed. I know it looks nice. Not a good place to put a picture because it, the chances are that's coming down on top of you. So um, uh, that's why I say stay in bed. You know, if you've got nothing above you, then there's nothing to worry about in that respect um, and covering yourself with the pillow. Um, a lot of people think they should get under the bed. I mean, it might be easy for kids, but for most of us adults, um, I know it would be a struggle for me to get under my bed. Um, and then, you know, it's a bit of a tight space. So um, it's really better just to stay put. Great. Thank you. Um, let's come back to... Uh, this is an interesting question, and I, I, I think any or all of us might want to respond to this one, but that is, what should we do if we're on a wildfire? So I think this, this might be one of our BC Wildfire Service folks um, who might be on a wildfire, and of course, so dry, continue to be dry. We're all hopeful for rain this weekend. What, what happens if we're on a wildfire and an earthquake happens? I feel like that's an incident command question. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, John, do you want to yeah. the lob the ball over the fence to you? Yeah, it really depends where where you are. Yeah, um, uh, indoors, outdoors. Yeah, D yeah. difficult one to answer without without a little yeah. bit. Little I bit think it's just a drop cover hold on. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, anything. yeah, I agree. and then get away from the fire. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, drop cover and hold on, but I think incident command. You know, your your the leadership. You know, in whatever situation you're in, should be radioing you or, and or your colleagues and telling you either to get out or to keep doing what you're doing. I think it will really depend on the circumstance, the size of the quake, the location where you are, how close you are to water, if, you know, if there's a tsunami threat. I mean, all of those things would be factors in in what we would suggest you, you do or don't do. So um, I'm going to I'm going to suggest check with incident command. Um, that's my favorite answer. Um, OK. <laughs> How about uh, what form would the early alert take, an alarm or a message on a phone? So, Allison, I think you mentioned that this is really going to be like a push notification to cellular phones in advance of an earthquake. The idea is that it comes 10 or 15 seconds, hopefully, um, before a quake occurs. Is that is that right? Yeah. And the idea is um, we, we don't we are still working out what the message will be, but it will be something like um, uh, earthquake alert. Um, strong shaking imminent protect yourself or something like that um because the 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 system has detected that an earthquake is is is, is happening and that the waves are on their way to you and so we need you to take immediate action and we won't necessarily be able to tell you how much time you have it could be just a few seconds so really drop cover hold on uh that's the this is not to tell you to evacuate or anything like that mm -hmm. um so um, it, yeah, that's how it'll be received on the phone. You sh there'll be an alarm as well as the message. Um, and uh, that, that's the idea. Uh, and I think someone in, in the chat was saying, you know, where is it, this gonna be? 
So um, the system is being developed for the high risk areas of Canada. Right now, we're focused on Western British Columbia, Eastern Ontario and Southern Quebec. We're evaluating whether we're going to expand that coverage into Southwestern Yukon or um, Atlantic Canada. So th that's still being evaluated, but that's currently Western British Columbia is what, the area that would be um, alerted. And of course, for really big earthquakes, um, that, that alerting could get go further east. Um, so when we have the mega thrust earthquake, people fairly far east will feel that earthquake. It may not be, it, it, they'll only get the alert if, if it's potentially harmful though, if it, if it could cause damage or injury. I think, I, you know, that's such an, you know, where the priority areas are initially certainly are in those seismically active areas, right? So British Columbia, that, that corridor through, through Ontario and Quebec. I mean, you know, that's mm -hmm. where the priority is, I think, in the short term, but it's good to hear that there may be opportunity to, to expand that if and when um, necessary. I think we'll take an opportunity here to do a quick poll. So uh, you can yeah. um, answer the poll on your device and I'll share the results back. So uh, if you have an earthquake and you're at home, should you get into a doorway? Should you run outside or should you drop cover and hold on? I feel like we're going to get a good response on this one because I feel like we've said it a lot. So, so far we're running at hundred percent. So this is good. <laughs> um, I'll let you guess which one people are saying, but um, we'll give folks just a minute here to, to respond in the chat or sorry, respond in the poll, not the chat, in the poll. And then I'll come back to the questions. But well, maybe while we're waiting for folks to do that, um, I'll ask another question here. So so this is an interesting question, and John, you were we were talking a little bit about liquefaction a second ago, and you were talking about building code and those and the um, building codes for you know commercial businesses or large scale uh, structures. So when did the building codes for homes begin to change? Uh, if they might be located in say a high liquefaction area or perhaps a high earthquake risk area, can you speak a little bit to bro more broadly the building codes and how those have shifted or when they changed? Yeah, um, building code started in 1940, so not not for liquefaction, and I I I can't speak to when you know, or how how look. I don't think liquefaction folds into the for for single family residences for most small homes, um, but certainly beginning in 1940, 1953, um, 1970, there was a very major update. 1985. Um, but every five years, the building codes are updated with the latest information, the latest science, the latest engineering practices. So the most recent um, national building code in Canada was in 2020, and it will be updated again in, in um, about three years, in 2025. So they're updated regularly and increasing as, as our knowledge increases and improves. That's great. Thanks, John. I know um, our friends in Alaska... Uh, California, Oregon, and um, Washington State have also been making adjustments to their building codes and, you know, adding additional things like, um, uh, oh my gosh, just went out of my brain, uh, vertical evacuation. <laughs> That's where I was going. <laughs> uh, vertical evacuation, which I think is so interesting. So uh, maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll save that for for another another conversation um, about maybe the opportunities around around that, uh, but. As predicted, 100% uh, on the drop, cover, and hold on. So everybody knows that if there is an earthquake in their home, that their first thing they should do is drop, cover, and hold on. And I will say, and just, you know, for any folks that might be listening, or if you have a loved one or a family member who uses an assistance device or a mobility device, um, the safest thing for them to do is to lock, cover, and hold on. So we want to we want to lock the wheels on whatever that um, whatever that device is, uh, whether it's a wheelchair or a, a, some other assistance device, um, scooter even. Lock those wheels. Get as close to an exterior wall as you can. Cover your neck and head to the best of your ability. That's going to be the safest place to be. Um, so somebody's asking about vertical evacuation. What is ver vertical evacuation? Is effectively a structure that goes upwards. It's often used in areas that would be um, high tsunami risk. And people have then the opportunity to, to go, literally to go up um, and, and ideally move away. If they don't have the ability to really move too far away from the coast, um, they have the opportunity to go up, which is ideally getting out of harm's way. So we'll save that for, for another topic another day. Um, okay, how about, uh, I'm going to ask you some other questions. So John and Allison, how strong does an earthquake have to be in order for us to feel it? So John, you sort of said, you know, those two and three, 
uh, you know, magnitude quakes. Like, don't worry about those. But I don't know that I feel those two and three magnitude quakes. I, I see these, you know, these earthquake things coming in and I'm like, yeah, I didn't feel any of that. So um, like about when are we going to start to feel them? And um, and like how, how strong would they typically be? Well, the thing with earthquakes is that it, it's not just the size of the earthquake, it's how close you are to it. So if you're right on top of a two, you could feel it. But if that magnitude six is 150 kilometers away, you may not feel it. So this, it's not just the size, it's the distance. But generally speaking, people start feeling earthquakes around magnitude three or four. They can start getting damaging if they're really close at magnitude five. But generally, it's around magnitude six that you start to get damage. Um, and certainly in our, our region, I mean, British Columbia is prone to fairly large earthquakes. Um, the two largest instrumentally recorded earthquakes were um, in uh, on Haida Gwaii. One was at 8.1 in 1949, and then more recently, the magnitude 7.8 in 2012. Um, we have um, an indigenous history and you know evidence of magnitude 9 earthquakes off our coast along our Cascadia subduction zone. And then, of course, there are the larger earthquakes in her occur within the plates. Uh, so we're living on top of the North American plate and it can have earthquakes as large as say seven and a half. Those are some, the, like that. that's the ones that scare me. I think the ones that are a little over seven, I think, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. Um, John likes to say, I saw a little Twitter exchange with John and some folks earlier this week. And he, he was like, location, location, location. Earthquakes are like real estate, and it's all about the location. So I don't know, John. Do you want to? Do you want to clarify that? <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly <laughs> it. It's exactly what Allison um, has said that that where you are in relation to an earthquake is is really critical. So um, a magnitude six, six and a half, that's hundred or hundred and fifty kilometers away. You may not feel it. Um, and, and of course, we like to learn from earthquakes around the world. So if we look at New Zealand back in, uh, in Christchurch area, um, back in 2010, there was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake, which is a very large and damaging earthquake um, near, it was 40 kilometers from Christchurch. It was the largest earthquake in that area since the 1930s. So it was a really rare earthquake on an unknown fault. Uh, it was sort of a surprise earthquake in that region. And Christchurch is very similar to Victoria. So we learned a lot from this region. Um, but an earthquake at 40 kilometers away, a 7.1, uh, there were no casualties. There were no uh, fatalities from that earthquake in Christchurch. Uh, it caused a lot of damage, but no one was killed by that earthquake at 40 kilometers away. Uh, a short time later, there was a much smaller earthquake, a 6.3, that occurred directly beneath the city of Christchurch, and 185 people were killed during that earthquake. It was an incredibly strong shaking, a number of buildings uh, collapsed, and, and um, the entire downtown core was closed, much of it for years following that earthquake. Um, so it really shows the in a 6.3 earthquake is six times smaller than the one that had occurred a few months earlier that was 40 kilometers away. So that 40 kilometers distance makes a huge difference in the case of a large earthquake. So um, it really is about location. It's about where the earthquake occurs and how close to the surface that earthquake is. Um, so one of the other questions here is, you know, what magnitude earthquake are we expecting for the quote unquote big one? I think, you know, we always debate about, you know, when is it going to happen and how large is it's going to be? So I, I think, I, you know, I'll let you weigh in, uh, Allison and John. How large do we anticipate that this big quake could be? I think most people refer to the big one that they're talking about the Cascadia Megathrust earthquake. Um, and estimate that be about a magnitude nine if the full rupture if the fault full fault ruptures if only part of the fault ruptures it'll be smaller uh, so it it depends on whether that that whole fault it goes um and of course with the the um with the uh cascadia megathrust you also have the dr drama of the, the the tsunami so um it's sort of like a double hazard because you've got the strong shaking for three to five minutes. And then after that, you've got a tsunami hitting our, our coastlines, especially that outer coast. So knowing what to do and where to go whenever you're around the coastline is a really good, important thing to do. Absolutely. 
Um, and it, I, you know, so I come from the tourism world and, and I think it is so, so important that we normalize this conversation. So when folks arrive on our beautiful West coast of Vancouver Island or in Victoria or in Richmond, that we're talking about very kindly where high ground is. And, you know, we, and you just talk about it, like you're having an everyday conversation with someone as we're escorting them to their room, we're explaining, just so you know, we're on, we're, you know, we're in a seismically active area. If there was to be a tsunami warning, this is where how you get to high ground. So we're just helping to create that muscle memory in an area where individuals may not have that level of familiarity that we have if we're in our own home or if we're in our own community. So um, a little yeah, different. It, sorry, I don't, I don't want to interrupt, uh, but I was going to say in, in the situation where you feel the earthquake, the earthquake is your warning. Yes. Tsunami warnings are only usually sent out um, in, in, in terms of in time if for events that are far away that you won't feel but that will cause a tsunami that could impact our, our right. outer coast. Um, but for, for when we have the mega thrust, that strong shaking, if mm -hmm. it's more than a minute, move to high ground. Yeah, yeah the, the ground shaking is your tsunami warning. That's a, that's a good takeaway. Um, I did put, this is my favorite question to ask John, um, because we get this question a lot online. There's a lot of debate about this, usually on Twitter. It's my favorite place to hang out and talk about earthquakes um, and, other, <laughs> and other hazards. So having, the question is, having lots of small earthquakes uh, is good because it releases the pressure in the earth and makes a big earthquake less likely. So we're like almost 50-50 on this, John. So you get to weigh in and tell folks yeah. how they feel. Um, yeah, and that's a very common question. And it's a very common belief that uh, tiny earthquakes or small earthquakes release the energy. They don't. They're they're so small um, that they're really drops in a in a very giant bucket. Um, and the, the thing is that magnitude scale is logarithmic. So when you go from a three to a four, um, the shaking is 10 times stronger for a four, but the energy release is about 32 times greater. So it just goes up so fast. Um, if, if we look at a magnitude nine earthquake and we work backwards to see how many magnitude three earthquakes it would take to release the energy of a single magnitude nine, uh, it would take uh, more than one billion magnitude three earthquakes, which um, you know we we simply don't see. We the magnitude nine earthquakes occur every four or five hundred years, um, so it would be millions of magnitude threes each year. We don't see that. Um, you know the, the these tiny earthquakes that we record, the the few thousand that we locate are so small, they're, they're really insignificant compared to a single large magnitude seven or eight or nine. So it's, um, they don't help, but, but <laughs> they, do, they, they do remind us, they remind us that, you know, certainly as seismologists in the office, and we see that, um, you know, seismograph needle shaking every day, um, they remind us that we live in an earthquake zone. We see these tiny earthquakes and we can use those earthquakes to learn about the earth and the faults and, and how waves travel and how waves are magnified or amplified in some areas. So they're all really useful, but they're not releasing the, they're not releasing the energy, sadly. Thank, thanks, John. Thanks for busting the myth for everybody. That's great. Um, okay, I've got one last question here and then I'm gonna change gears and we're gonna go to um, Anita who's gonna share some, well, I'll, I'll save what we're gonna share, but um, okay, one last question. Cassie is a great question here. So. Um, they are sharing, we read that Abbotsford is subject to three different types of earthquakes. Do you know what kind of, what kind of earthquakes they are and how concerned should we be? So I think what they're referring to there are the three areas you can have the earthquakes. So the subduction zone, we were just talking about that. That's that mega thrust earthquake that happens off our coastline that would definitely impact that, you know, well east of where you are. And then there are the earthquakes within the North America plate, the one you're sitting on. And then there, there are the earthquakes that are happening in the subducting one, if you could play, as it, it bends and goes down into the mantle. So I, if I could just quickly share my screen, I do have an image for that. I'm trying to find it. Okay. Of course you have an image for that, Allison. You have an image for everything. Okay. So um, let me just uh, see if I can, uh, gee, um, sorry, uh, share screen. There we go. And I will make this full screen when I get the sharing done. Oops, it's not going to show it. Uh, oopsie. Sorry. Sorry, folks. Um, 
There we go. So uh, there are the earthquakes along the subduction zone. This is the subduction zone along here, and it goes down into Northern California. We've got the earthquakes in the North America plate, and then these other ones in the uh, Wanda Fuca plate as it bends and goes down into the mantle. So those are the three types that we were talking about. And that little star is the um, is the Nisqually earthquake that not yeah the Nisqually earthquake that happened down near Olympia in two thousand one. So hopefully that's helpful. Awesome, thanks, that's Allison. Awesome. Oh, sure. She always she always has some you know subduction zone shots available at an, at a, at a moment's notice. I love that. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay, so great questions. Feel free to keep those coming in the in the Q and A. Um, but we're gonna change gears and we're gonna but I'm gonna do a poll first, Nita. We'll just see how folks how folks do here. Okay, so the question is, Anita is with BC Hydro. Uh, so if you come across downed power lines, we all know that the first thing we should do is call 911, but what else should you do? So you should, if you come across downed power lines, you should call 911 and run, uh, stand back at least a school bus length, move closer to take a picture or stay in your car. So we'll, let, we'll give folks a minute here to, to weigh in, Anita, and then you can, uh, you can, you can, you can share what, what you think. Okay. How's it looking? I'm curious. Oh, it's, 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 you know, it's, uh, it's, it's like 50, 50 right now, but I won't tell you what 50. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to wait till I, <laughs> till I can turn the pull around. Okay, here we go. Um, so. Stand back at least a school bus length or stay in your car. So, so the, yeah, those are two really good answers. I guess the, my question would be, where did you come across the power lines from, right? If you were on foot, then definitely I would hope that you stay at least a school bus length away. That's because if the power line uh, touches the ground and if it's got any sort of energy in it, uh, the energy will radiate in a tight circle around it. And if you're close to it, then you're going to feel that voltage. I think that's the simplest way I can describe it. There's more complicated ways of discussing it, but really the further away you are, the less energy you can get from that power line if it's feeding energy into the ground. Now, if you're in your car, uh, that's a different scenario. And, and for that, I would say it depends on where you are and where the power line is. If it's uh, more than a bus length away from you, I'd say just stay in your car. Uh, and if you can safely, after everything stops shaking, of course, uh, back away. Uh, great. Otherwise, like remain in your car. Your car has rubber tires. If there's nothing, if your car isn't uh, on fire, or there's another hazard within your car and a crying child is not a hazard that can get you. It can irritate you, but it's not that degree. They're still safe. Them. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say stay in your car. The other thing I also remind people is if you are in your vehicle and you see a power line down in front of you, power lines are connected like elastic bands. So the ones behind you could have action happen too. If like the poles shook, something broke in front, you know, if you can't really see where other damage is, um, I always tell people, you know, if you've called 911, there's somebody on the street, roll down your window and say, hey, am I clear to back up or drive forward? That external set of eyes really helps you avoid another hazard that you might not be aware of. So uh, my suggestion to people is like, yeah, be aware of your surroundings, stay far away. If you're in your vehicle, see what the biggest hazard is. Is a power line on top of your car? Yeah, try and get out, but make sure you don't get tangled further. Uh, and uh, I know we always lead into it. What if the situation is such that you absolutely do have to get out of your car. Like something happened, there's damage, something fell on top of it, smoking, and you're like, oh, I need to get out. Then we have to do a slightly more complicated piece where staying in your car isn't super safe. So now the thing is, if there's a downed power line beside your car, that radius, you're in the zone where a lot of energy could transfer to you. So what you have to kind of do, and this is a really hard maneuver to do, and sometimes we practice it, and I'm not the best at it, but what you have to do is basically open your vehicle and try and jump as far away as you can from your uh, power line, which like let's assume it's beside your car, uh, without touching the outside of your car and landing on like your two feet pretty much directly beside each other as far away as you can from, from that, that power line. And, and then this is the bit like every 
BC Hydro employee knows how to do this. It's uh, it's called the shuffle. Where the safety you walk, shuffle. The safety shuffle, yes. Where you try and you walk away if a down power line lands up beside you. Uh, what someone told me to remember was you have to have two points of contact for the energy to cause you harm. If you are standing with your feet right next to each other, you just have one point of contact. That electricity doesn't have anywhere else uh, that for that voltage to go. And if you shuffle away, basically kind of like keeping your feet together as if you're you're you know holding a piece of paper between your feet and just kind of move your feet forward, you're not really changing uh, the distance between your feet. And so that voltage has nowhere to jump out. There's no second point of contact. And so you do the safety shuffle away. So uh, I like that people were thinking about, well, was I in the car? Or was I not on the car? Because your response really depend on where you were when that piece went down, how close it was to you and what other problems are happening around you. So really, I mean, what we're doing is really what we should be doing all the time, which is a risk assessment, right? We kind of have to make an individual assessment about is it safe to stay in our home? Is it safe to stay in our car? Um, you know, if we need, if we feel like we need to get out of the car, then that's the right decision. Um, but being able to move, you know, in emergency management, we often say, you know, move quickly and safely. You know, if there's a wildfire, we want people to move quickly. In the case of a down power line, we want people to move slowly and be very methodical and thoughtful about how they're moving. So, you know, these are the things in the moment. So you can all go home and, and on BC Ferries website, BC Ferries, on BC Hydro's um, website, you can see the safety shuffle. So you should all check, you should check that out and you should teach your kids how to, how to do it. It'll be a fun, like it'll be like a dance party. Friday night, you can all do the BC Hydro safety shuffle. So thank yeah, that and the electric slide. That's the other right? one that we, have, we have to know because it's electric, so. Seems reasonable. Um, <laughs> Anita, what do you anticipate? Let's do one, one last question here. What, what do you anticipate, you know, might, what might we see? We've talked a little bit about telecommunications infrastructure perhaps being damaged. What do you anticipate from a, from a hydro perspective? You know, so with the, storms, you can pre-position folks, but it doesn't really work with an earthquake. We don't plan those. Exactly. I, I, that's, that's the point that I was going to make, that when we have a storm coming, we amass our crews, we make sure our, all the gear we need is prepared, we, we, we sit and just prep ourselves, just like emergency preparedness for the response that we have, whether it's more people that we need on the ground, more equipment, where do we think the damage is gonna be? We won't have that lead time for an earthquake. We won't have that half day where you know a system is moving in. And so our response will not be quite uh, as uh, ample as we do for storm season. Um, and so, uh, I think what we like to tell people is that like it might take longer for your power to come back on because we'll be dealing with infrastructure damage that we didn't anticipate. We won't have had time to muster our crews and our equipment and we might not be able to drive out to fix the damage too because if the roads are out then we have to figure out how to get through bridges and, and all of that. So we tell people that yeah if, if an earthquake happens we are prepared for it in the sense that we do exercises and every time there is a storm, we kind of respond in the same fashion that we would. However, it's going to take longer than when your power goes out and you have that wind storm and every all the trees blow over. It takes like a, you know, however long it takes for the power to come on, it will take longer for us to systematically be able to muster our crews and get to the locations that need our help. So uh, I think that's what we uh, we kind of hope. And uh, we have a team that's uh, completely just dedicated to emergency management. I'm not on that team. I'm on the public safety side. But I know that they do plans and drills and think about how, uh, like, which will be the command centers, the nerve centers that we will feed all our equipment and, and our crews out of uh, when we do have this kind of unexpected event come upon us. And I, I mean, I think it's perfect. We're going to talk about emergency kits here and, you know, what our personal uh, opportunities are here and our personal responsibilities are to be, be ready. Um, but, you know, Allison talked about it too, you know, just the drilling and the knowing what to do and having that muscle memory. And that's the same with your crews. Like, that's what I'm hearing you say. We're training and we're practicing and we're going to be ready. Um, yeah. The other, you know, sort of layer here, and I think, you know, certainly, um, you know, hurricanes often kind of bring this forward, and we saw this with Hurricane Katrina and some of the, the comments around, 
needing to repair infrastructure versus needing to replace infrastructure. Um, and, and, and that, you know, that it's depending on the size of the, of an earthquake, you know, there, it may not be as simple as just, you know, repairing things. There may need to be some, some replacement equipment and sometimes that takes time. So, um, as we shift into emergency preparedness, I think one of those things we need to remember is being patient, <laughs> right? Um, you know, we need to, we each need to be ready and we need to, and so, um, I'll, I'm going to ask Jerry to share with us. Um, what we should have in our emergency kit. But I'm going to first, Jerry, before we start, I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll and I'm going to ask folks to tell me what do they think should be in their emergency kit. So um, so you can you can only choose one thing, but uh, there's a lot of good choices here. So a small toy, a stuffy, or a puzzle book with a pen or a pencil, hard candy or gum, a foil blanket and seasonal clothing, a solar or crank cell phone charger. Um, you might also have a solar or crank radio. Could be any or all of those things. And then I, I know so bad. Like, yeah. keep clicking. Just, <laughs> You're like, I just want to click on all the things. I, just I love click, it. So yeah. So but before we get Jerry, I'm before Jerry talks about this, I'm gonna ask all of our panelists, like, what's your what's the favorite thing or your let's call it a comfort item that you have in your emergency kit? Allison, do you want to go first? Sure. What's um, your comfort item? Well, for me, um, I love food and it's but food is a surf. <laughs> Food is just a source of comfort, and I especially like spicy food. So I've got chili peppers and some good curries in my my, my emergency kit. Um, the other thing is that uh, my family is a bit addicted to playing uh, Crazy Rummy, so a couple decks of cards are in there too. Awesome! I love that, Anita. What's what's your uh, what's in your what's your let's call it your comfort item in your in your emergency kit for your family? I have one of those hand crank radios because I think the silence would really <laughs> and and. Uh, I've gone camping, and if you have a very energetic child, a hand crank radio is a great activity that allows people to generate uh, energy and kind of contain themselves. Have some be busy. Them. I yeah. like that's a good strategy. I mean, I have one of those, but it didn't occur to me to let my to give it to my kid and get her. Oh yeah, to and, get her and you say, hey, can you make me some music? And then you know, people have something to do too. I think what. Uh, what is really frustrating in emergency situations uh, is uh, we all want to, I don't know, in my family, we all want to be doing something. So that can give the littlest person something to do. And it sounds good. Yeah. John, what's your, what's your favorite item in your emergency kit? What's your comfort item? Oh, you got it. Oh, that's your headlamp, but you have to turn your mic on so we can hear you. John, you're muted. Sure. Thanks, Jen. I can see your um, headphone, your well, headlamp. The, the headlamp, so that you, I don't like sitting in the dark, so you can actually see what you're doing. Your hands are free if you need to move things or collect things. Um, so that's number one. And then the, the radio, the hand crank radio uh, as well, is, is just a great item to have. You don't have to worry about batteries. You can just crank it up and uh, try and find out what's happening from other sources. Awesome. So before I go to Jerry, um, I did a, did an interview today and it was one of my friends who was doing the interview and they said, Jen, how many bags of chips do you have in your emergency kit? And I felt like I should say, I don't want to answer that question, but I said, well, we should be prepared for 14 days. So I feel like I should have 14 to 16 bags of chips. That seems reasonable to me. So just saying, I won't tell you how large they are. Um, the other thing I really think is important is, and I don't know if you can all see this, but this is like, this is a down um, blanket. And I have it in my car emergency kit. I also have them in, in the emergency kit that's in my house. And it's like a blanket. So if, you know, we're delayed and we get stuck on the highway somewhere or we're at the ferry, uh, it's an awesome thing to have in your kit. So it's my, that's my, my favorite item in addition to the earthquake chips. I've heard of storm chips. These are earthquake chips. Okay. Um, Jerry, what's your favorite item? And then maybe you could share with us um, some emergency preparedness tips. Well, you already know I have the emergency bag of potato chips. That goes without saying, and as well, a good bottle of red wine. You know, this is why we're friends, here. Jerry. We're, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, I also like to have um, uh, brain candy. So I like to have a, a mystery novel that I can read and with it, I in, in a Ziploc bag and I have an extra pair of reading glasses. But the other thing I like, and I'm going to hold it up here, this is a solar powered um, light and it unfolds. That is so cool. 
and then you blow it up, blows up, and you can hang it from anything. And then uh, the next morning you deflate it, you put it out in the sun again, and you have light. And uh, I love that. I, I've got two of them, one's in the emergency kit, uh, one's from the emergency kit, and the other one is for um, the ever-present uh, winter store <laughs> that we always have. So um, you were talking about emergency kits, and the great thing earlier, uh, Allison and John in their slideshow did show some of the, the basic things that we have. So we all know we need to have water, we need to have some food, we need to have, you know, the can opener to open up our non-perishable foods, that sort of thing, uh, some sort of cooking source. Most of us have camping equipment, so we can use those. The tent. I think is really important to have in your emergency kit because, as Allison said, it may be just some parts of your house that are structurally not sound, but we're going to be sheltering in place. So it may be that you're going to have your tent in your living room because it might not be the summer. Maybe it's the winter. It's a bit colder. So having a tent, you'd be surprised how warm you can stay. But one of the things I think, and most of the times we don't talk about this, um, you know, we talk about our drinking water, but we need water for other things, basic hygiene. And last year, I'm going to use myself as an example, our pipes froze in the winter, so I didn't have water. And when you have to bring water in, you become very mindful of what you're using for your water. So one of the things that I do have in my emergency kit, and I'm going to hold it up in a Ziploc bag. I'm a big fan, that kind of, I'm a big fan of putting things in the bag. So what I have in here is an assortment of different types of wipes. So this one you can use for doing your face. This one may be for uh, your counters. This one is for doing other business. Um, that was very diplomatic. Uh, yes, <laughs> but hey, you're not gonna have sure. water for showers and things. Um, and most of us have, uh, you know, extra bottles of hand sanitizer now. So I always say, pop it all into a Ziploc bag. As long as you don't open any of these packages, they will stay fresh for quite a while. And I, um, and I do go through and look at them at the very least once a year, but it's usually um, during EP week and shakeout week. Hence, these are, Same. I just recycled these. <laughs> it's, it's a good time to do that. But it is really important because you, when you think about that water, each person in your household, just for basic to stay alive, to be healthy, needs three liters of water. But we say in emergency management, four liters of water per, per day. Then per person your, per day, yeah. That's right. Then you have your pets. So how much of this water are you going, you know, like, you know, you're, you're going to be doing some work. <laughs> You're going to be, you know, moving debris and stuff and you will get thirsty. So you, you're going to be thinking, when, you know, can I spare that water on hands and, and stuff? And really, what are the sorts of things that we really do end up in, with problems after a big earthquake? It's usually um, infections from not being able to uh, be very hygienic, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest, right? So the more little things like this, and they're not expensive. Um each of those little packages of wipes, I just bought a buck each, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not that bad. So, you know, even if you're on a tight budget, every once in a while, grabbing one and, and putting it in there, really, it's uh, really makes a difference. And that's um, the same I, with any of your emergency items though, Jerry, I think it's a little bit out of time, right? We don't have to go and buy a big giant kit all at once. So you, you certainly can, and those absolutely exist. Um, yeah. But a little bit at a time is, a is, little an, bit is at another a time. way to do it. And today um, I was doing an event and so we were talking about stuff in our emergency kits and a few people mentioned their uh, really horrible granola bars that they forget to recycle, right? <laughs> to go in every six months. So I actually don't put, I don't put granola bars in there. I buy a bar. I'm showing another thing. Um, you can buy these high energy bars that are good for five to six years. Mm -hmm. This cost me $2.50. It's, it's well worth buying one of these than throwing out because you've remembered, oh yeah, I've got to go and rotate that and you taste it and you go, Ugh. I don't want that. <laughs> Not going down. Yeah. So, you know, every once in a while, grabbing one of these, you know, and it, grabbing one for each member of the family and throwing that in there as well. High energy because you are going to be working. Yeah. I, I also grabbed, um, I have here a life straw. 
So this is yes. another thing that depending on where you are in, in the province or along the coast, I, I also have these in my car vehicle, but of course they're in my emergency kit too. And it's, you know, if, if you have access to reasonably fresh um, water, you know, a street, a, a stream or a creek, um, that this will auto filter the water as well. So you can safely drink it. So that's just one more option to have available to you. Jerry, actually, how long? Go ahead. I suggest people actually have those in their car because yeah. you don't know where you're going to be and you can drink out of a puddle with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Drink out, I'm going to tell people, you can. drink, you out, can of drink out of a puddle. I've demonstrated it. Oh, I love it. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm going to, I can feel my students are going to be like, Jen, we want to see you drink out of a puddle. I feel like this is going to be a thing. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I do want to ask you, Jerry, so we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the guidelines in BC, you know, sort of range. And if you ask our friends in Washington State and Oregon, they say to be ready for 14 days. Sometimes we hear 72 hours. Sometimes we hear seven days. What do you recommend for folks on the island and or beyond? What do you recommend in terms of how many days should we be self-sufficient for? Minimum of 14, really. Um, you know, Anita was talking about uh, BC Hydro uh, workers, you know, coming to restore power, but it might take some time. You've got to think about it. I would, I would call them a first responder, but then all the rest of the first responders as well. Everybody has their own family. So first, you've got to make sure everybody else in your family is safe. And then, as you know, we are going to have problems with roads and, and, and infrastructure. So it is going to take time. Water is going to take time. Um, all those different things. So it isn't going to be, uh, an, you know, push a button and 72 hours, we're back to normal. I mean, you look at uh, Christchurch. I think there's still a few places in Christchurch where they are running hose yes. on, on, on top of the streets because they could never go back. It was just too costly to go back and put in full infrastructure again. So, you know, be mindful. We, we've got to be looking after ourselves for quite some time. And our neighbors, right? And our we neighbors. We should be looking after our, our neighbors, checking in on yes. those around us. Allison. Oh, you got to unmute, my friend. <laughs> oh, darn it. Um, I'm just going to build on something that Jerry was talking about when she's talking about hygiene. Uh, one thing that came out of the Fort Mac fires was that a lot of people didn't have in their emergency kit their contact lens solution and little caddy. And there were a lot of eye infections. Mm -hmm. So having um, your a contact lens solution and a little kit, um, if you do wear contacts, um, and, and someone had put in the chat and, and reminder to have some prescription medication as well. The, yeah. the other thing that this is going to sound funny, um, but one, and I, it's ironic because I saw it in the aftermath of Hurricane Fiona in, in, in Atlanta, Canada, is actually dentures. So it might be difficult for somebody to have a spare pair of dentures, but it is one of those things that often, you know, it's the middle of the night. John was saying, you know, chances are this earthquake is going to happen in the middle of the night and you get up and leave your home, you go outside and your teeth are on the side table somewhere in the dust. So um, that that's something to consider, just like eyeglasses. If you have a spare pair of readers, if you use readers, make sure you have a spare pair in your, in your emergency kit. Um, absolutely medication and daily medication if you if you take daily medication um you know allergy meds things like that and so the medication is a hard one mm -hmm. you know things like aller allergy medication yes you can put that in your emergency kit but you know the way things are now with pharmacies they don't let you take extra so that you can put it aside i've had many discussions with pharmacists uh, you know to do with this because it makes it quite difficult mm -hmm. in emergency planning because really you want to have basically at least a week's worth but you know try and have two weeks worth of extra medication yeah. it's it's quite difficult and and some of those medications like i'm thinking about insulin for example it needs to be yes. refrigerated so it's not so simple to just you know have it available in your homes but it is something to sort of be be thoughtful about if if you know you have allergies or if, you know when you're planning the food that's going to be in your emergency kit, thinking about those dietary concerns or food allergies of the individuals in your home, making sure your pets are looked after, you know, all of those, all of those are important. All of those are important factors. Um, I'm really mindful of the time. We're a little over here. It's 806, if you can believe that, panelists. Um, such great questions from everybody uh, coming in tonight. We will, I'm just going to say uh, thank you. If there are any sort of final questions, this is your last call to uh, to type those into the Q&A. Um, otherwise, you will receive from 
from me, actually, tomorrow, you will receive a link to the posting of this recording, and it will be on our BC Shakeout page. If you are not registered yet for Shakeout, please go to bc or shakeout.bc.ca and register. If you forgot to register and you um, uh, want to uh, still participate, you can absolutely do that. So please uh, go to the Shakeout BC website and you can, uh, you can do that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, Allison, put it in the chat for us. So it's shakeout.shakeoutbc.ca. And there is a backslash <laughs> register. It'll take you straight to the registration page or you can link it right off the homepage. Yeah, unfortunately it's, it's only it's not showing to host and panelists yeah. rather than everyone else. I don't think but it yeah. shows to everybody. That's okay. Maybe if you go. Google it, you'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Uh, I'll, I'll type it in for everybody. Okay. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we're, we're glad to have you. I hope you learned something uh, that's a little different and and that we didn't scare you, <laughs> that we gave you some information that's useful and helpful, and you can um, go ahead and make make your um, uh, make your plans and keep your family safe when the earth shakes. So thanks for being with us, and uh, we will talk to you soon. And we got a nice comment from Becky who says, um, "Thank you for your touch on the house. Oh, this is me, I guess. Thanks for your touch on the hospitality industry. It's important to normalize the topic. So that's great. So I was thinking all of us. <laughs> you know, we're trying to normalize the topic. That is what we're trying to do. So. Um, thanks, Becky, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next year. Happy ShakeOut. <laughs>